Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar. We're going to be getting started shortly. As folks filter in and get connected, I do have some upcoming announcements for you all. On Wednesday, November 29th, we'll be having a free webinar on the California Artificial Stone and Silicosis Project with Kristen Cummings, MD, MPH, and Robert Harrison, MD, MPH. You can learn about that webinar and register on our website. I'm going to put the link in the chat for you. Um, the California Labor Lab also has a blog. We invite you to check out our most recent post on tackling workplace challenges, resources for Bay Area workers. And the link to the blog is also in the chat. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the California Labor Lab webinar. The California Labor Lab is a NIAF Center of Excellence for Total Worker Health, and we're pleased to have you here today. A few housekeeping items. You will be muted during today's presentation. If you'd like to ask a question, please enter it into the online Q&A box. And we'll be saving time at the end of the presentation to address as many questions as possible. This presentation is being recorded and will be made available on the California Labor Lab and Center for Occupational and Environmental Health YouTube page in the next five business days. And all participants who logged in with their registration email for the full live presentation today will receive an email tomorrow with a link to the evaluation form that will qualify you for a certificate of completion with one continuing education contact hour. Once the evaluation is completed, you'll be able to access and print your certificate. And it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today. We're going to get to hear from Dr. Edward Yellen. He is the principal investigator of the California Labor Lab. He has been researching the impact of changes in employment for several decades with a focus on marginalized groups. And in his work, he has shown how the shift from a manufacturing to services economy has affected persons with disabilities and those with multiple characteristics that jeopardize employment. Dr. Yellen has also studied how persons with specific severe chronic diseases are faring in employment, and conversely, how work can lead to their conditions, or at least to the progression of their conditions. So today he's here to share some more recent research coming out of the California Labor Lab, and we're delighted to hear it. Looking forward to your presentation, Dr. Yellen. Thanks, Michelle. And I will share my screen, and hopefully this will work well. So everybody, I assume, can see it. We are and, good to go. Um, great. So we've titled our um, presentation from the Work and Health Survey, The Future of Work is Now. And I'll hope, hope you'll see in the next 35 or 40 minutes why. I'm presenting on behalf of the project team that includes myself, Laura Trupin, and Nari Ree. Alicia LaFrance, Tricia Eiley, and Ima Varghese Mack. Why is this not advancing? There we go. So a disclaimer, which I'm not gonna keep up. So the context for the California Labor Lab and this particular study is that many analysts agree that the labor market has undergone profound changes in the ways people are hired to work. In the post-World War II era, characterized by high rates of unionization and so-called traditional work, which was full-time, full-year employment, usually for a single employer with full, formal hiring and full benefits. In the new modes, many people argue, diffuse responsibility for worker welfare from the firm to the worker. But some of the signposts that people point to are not unique to this era. For instance, seasonal and task or project-based employment have always existed. Um, in California, the agriculture and entertainment sectors, one lower wage, one higher wage, have always used project-based or task-based employment. So when we think about the changes in the California Labor Lab project, we're focusing on three axes, the use of alternative employment arrangements, including independent contracting, on-call work, being employed by a temp agency and having work subcontracted out, the use of contingent forms of employment, 
And simultaneously, the erosion of workplace benefits and protections that arose in 20th century, including formal ways providing workers' voice. So why this study? Why California? So the main reason is that there are questions about the reliability of measurements of alternative and contingent employment. And there are very few studies that look at the impact of these changes on the well-being, including the health of the workforce. And lastly, there's a suspicion that the changes that have been written about may be more prevalent in California due to the mix of old, for instance, agriculture, construction, entertainment, and new tech and app-based work in industries in the state that use these forms of employment. So a couple of weeks ago, this article appeared in um, the New York Times in two installments. Um, first, as you'll see in, in the blue box there, your inquiries to the Times came after an article in the Times Magazine found migrant children working overnight shifts for contractors in companies plants on the Eastern shore of Virginia. Children as young as 13 were using Asher and pressure hoses to scour blood grease and feathers from industrial machines. But the chicken producers, Tyson and Pertu, um, didn't face, did know, said they didn't know about this because they were contract workers. Another issue is j about just how common these forms of employment are. And several years ago, two prominent, and I mean very prominent economists, um, Katz and Kruger, um, initially observed uh, and claimed a large increase in the alternative employment arrangements using the Amer RAND American Life Panel in lieu of the Blue Bureau of Labor Statistics Contingent Worker Survey, um, which at that point hadn't been done in a long time. It's since been done again. But then they had to retract their claim because of some methodological problems that others um, brought to their attention. So at the end of their retracted retraction article, they concluded that maybe these um, forms of employment weren't actually growing. In part because of the report and in part because of general concerns about the measurements of alternative employment, National Academy of Sciences um, had a committee that issued a report in 2020 on measuring alternative employment. And they said that many of the problems um, could be summarized as the reference period for employment questions. Much alternative work is done episodically, but the Bureau of Labor Statistics employment questions in most labor market surveys only cover the week prior to interview. Much alternative work concerns secondary jobs, not primary or main jobs. There's confusion about contract employment. The usual question in surveys asks about procuring one's own work when some work, many work for one employer long term, a very common practice in Silicon Valley. There's confusion about self employment and what exactly it means, particularly for incorporated um, small businessmen. There are issues about day labor shift work, on-call labor, and the regularity of employment. And lastly, there's questions about the validity of items about contingent work, um, which is dependent on expectations of continuity. As somebody once joked, we're all contingent. So the aims of the California Work and Health Survey were threefold. To expand the scope of inquiry about the labor market, to include a greater number of jobs, including secondary jobs, and those worked in the month prior to interview, as well as the week prior to interview. To improve items related to emergent working conditions and potential misclassification of workers, and to document the prevalence of impact of alternative and contingent employment, especially, especially for marginalized workers. So why do a study in California when the BLS does studies nationally? There's some evidence from the BLS surveys on alternative employment. When you look at the Pacific Census region, which is what you 
the um, division that you can get easily from the BLS surveys. Um, and obviously California's largest point part of that for all forms of alternative employment and for independent contracting, the largest um, or most frequent form of alternative employment, they were more common in the Pacific census region. So that suggests that um, California as the largest part of the Pacific census region may in fact differ from the rest of the country. You, for the other forms of alternative employment, um, the differences were not um, as pronounced or not at all, but those are very low frequency kinds of jobs. And um, the same thing applies to um, contingent employment. The BLS has three definitions, um, more middle and less stringent. And um, for all of them, the contingent employment was about 30% more common in the Pacific region than in the remainder of the country. So now we turn to the California Work and Health Survey from 2022 to 2023, um, one of the main projects of the California Labor Lab. We began with the questionnaire development process to better characterize the emergent workforce in the current California economy we um, did some consultation with labor market ex experts, interviews with key informants and in select industries, the ride share, warehousing, janitorial, restaurants, tech and day laborers. And new items that were developed and tested using cognitive interviewing techniques, um, which evolved, the questions evolved from the interviews that we had done. The, source, the new items that came out of this concern the sources of potential misclassification or reporting bias in independent contracting. We included questions about the tax forms received, W-2 or 1099, and the kind of employment deductions, if any, taken, for instance, taxes and Social Security, method of payment, and whether or not the job involved piecework. Because we are in California, we also developed and fielded questions about the so-called ABC criteria from California's AB5. And they, they, those three criteria are who decides how work is done, what is the industry of the company for which the work is done, is it the same as the consultants, and whether one is in business for oneself. We also, um, developed or and modified some previous questions that existed on app-based work. And we included specific companies later categorized into kinds of um, areas of employment. The overall content of the survey for the employment, we collected information on both main and second jobs in the week or month prior to interview. For both of those, we ask occupation industry, alternative arrangements and contingent employment. And for the main job, because we were limited in time, working conditions, including ergonomic, psychosocial demands and place in a workplace hierarchy. In health status, we ask standard measures of overall physical and mental health status, a list of chronic conditions and symptoms, health behaviors and health insurance. We collected information about demographics, and then in terms of economic circumstances, we all asked household income level and sources of income and personal earnings. We asked about public benefit recipiency and the respondents assessment of the adequacy of their income. Data I'll show you in a few minutes. So the, for the California Work and Health Survey, um, the in, ages of inclusion were 18 to 70. The survey was conducted between November 2022 and late April 2023. All contact was initiated with phone calls to potential res respondents. However, the surveys could then be completed by telephone interview or self-administered web platform questionnaire. 
The random digit dial sample of cell phone numbers included both regular and prepaid plans and combined covered nearly all of the target population of Californians 18 to 70. The results I'm reporting today are weighted to the California population. So um, as you no doubt know, there are a lot of numbers out of service, but eventually after starting with 135,000 numbers, we made contacts with 15,164 people whose um, numbers were in service. Of those, um, 2,126 were ineligible because they weren't in the age range. Um, we had 60% refusals, 9,000 some odd, and we completed 4,014 um, interviews. Um, and these are long interviews and that probably affected things. But 26% um, turns out to be a very respectable participation rate in this day and age, as some people on the call on, on watching this webinar know. So the Bureau of Labor Statistics definitions of alternative work, which loom large in our project, include independent contractors of two kinds, those who are self-employed, and those who work for someone else as an independent contractor on a long-term basis. And those are sometimes called wage and salary independent contractors. A good example would be, for instance, some of the tech firms hire programmers or don't literally hire them, but have them work as consultants um, doing programming for many, many years on end. So that's distinct from somebody who's self-employed. Alternative employment also includes on-call workers, people who are being paid by a temporary agency and people whose employment is subcontracted out. The BLS definitions of contingent work, which we use, um, are the most conservative measure requires the individual to have held a job for less than 12 months, not expect the job to last another 12 months, and not be self-employed. The second definition is the same as the first, but they may be self-employed. And the third simply asks, does the individual not expect their job to last? And it ignores job tenure. We also, in the survey, asked about jobs secured from an app. That's a separate concept from alternative contingent jobs and people often confuse them. So in terms of what we got by expanding the time frame from the week prior to the month prior to interview and the scope from mean to second jobs, we increased by 6% the number of people we identified as employed. That is to say there are 6% more Californians who work over a month compared to the number who work over the week prior to interview. For all independent contractors, when you combine time frame and scope, we identified 28% more independent contractors than we would have um, by a main job alone in the in the week prior to interview. 35% more alternative workers, 46% more contingent workers using the second or middle definition of contingency and 42% more app-based workers. In this slide, we simply show the employment status of those whom, 20, of whom we interviewed. When you use expansion weights to estimate the numbers in the California population, um, there were approximately 27 million Californians in the age range. Of those, 72% were in the labor force, which just simply means they were either employed or actively looking for work. 67% were working in the week prior to interview. 71% were current were employed in the month prior to interview. 80% had worked at some point in the prior year, and 98% had worked at some point since they turned 18. In terms of the number of jobs held by working age Californians in the month prior to interview, um, slightly more than three quarters had one job 
Um, but 15% had two jobs and 7% had three or more jobs. In fact, some <laughs> people reported five, six, or even seven jobs um, in that month. The minority of working age Californians, though, work full time for the entire year. You see that in this in the blue um, slice, 45% work full time full year. More than a fifth work part time for only part of the year. So it's hardly the case that most people work full time for the full year. When we looked at um, people who worked less than full time, full time by giving a range of definitions in terms of work hours over a year and greater than full time, only 34% worked within the full time range. 44% worked less than full time and 22% worked greater than full time. Many people work a lot of hours to keep their families afloat. Hispanics, African Americans, and Native, Native Americans, Alaskan Natives, and women have lower employment weight rates in the week prior to interview, despite a strong labor market. So um, the rising tide didn't lift all boats. When you look at who's working in the past month, there's a strong education gradient. Only 48% of those with a high school education or less were employed versus 85% with some graduate education. Employment rates um, prior to normal retirement age of 65 begin to decline. In fact, employment peaks at age, um, the age range of 35 to 44 and then falls precipitously um, to only 37% between 65 and 70, but it's only 62% in the immediate um, years before age 65. Persons with disabilities continue to have um, low employment rates, even decades after the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. We also saw, however, no pronounced effect of nativity on employment. The US born and the non-US born had very similar employment rates. So here we get to one of the most important slides where we estimated the prevalence of various forms of alternative employment in the main job in the past seven days and any job in the past 30 days. In each case, the left bar is the main job in seven days and the 34 and the um, blue bar is the um, darker blue bar is in any job in the past 30 days. So for all forms of alternative employment, more than a third had some fine and reported alternative employment in any job in the past 30 days. 15% reported that they were a self-employed independent contractor, 7% that they were an independent contractor in that wage and salary category, and 21% combined into the two categories of independent contractor. Working for a temp agency is a fairly um, low prevalence, so 3% um, reported that kind of employment in any job in the past 30 days. 8% reported um, that they were on-call workers, but 12% said they worked as a subcontracted employer when we asked them about that. When we looked at the prevalence of contingent employment for the three definitions, you see that between seven and 12% had some contingent employment in a jo any job in the past 30 days with a slightly smaller percentage reporting it for a job in the past seven. When we looked at app-based employment, 8% had it in their main job in the past seven days and 11% had it in any job in the past 30 days. And we do believe these are higher estimates than many people have found around the country. But as many people in this audience may be interested, here we're reporting the number of app-based workers in the main job in the past seven days or any job in the past 30 days by the kind of app they work for in number of millions. So. 
1.4 million people in their main job in the past seven days reported that they got their work through an app and 2 million reported that for any job held in the past 30 days. I've highlighted two of the um, data points here that are of interest. In California, in the 30 days prior to interview, we estimate that there were 840,000 people who were handling app, who were doing app-based delivery services, and approximately 300,000 who who um, were rideshare drivers during that time frame. So, each kind of independent contractor is are more common in second jobs. For the self-employed independent contractors, a third of those with a second job reported that in that job, they were independent contractors versus 11% in the main job. Um, and the same is true for the wage and salary kinds of, um, of independent contractors, 11% reported that in a second job versus 6% in a main job. And together, 45% of those with a second job um, reported that they were independent contractors doing that job versus 17% in their main job. The same kinds of relationships hold for work that's contracted out and on-call work. So um, for on work that's contracted out, 13% of those with a second job um, reported that kind of work versus 11% in their main job. And um, for on-call work, 10% had were in a, did that in a second job versus 6% in the main job. For the temp agency, there was no statistically significant difference and the numbers are much smaller. The rates of alternative and app-based work are also higher in second jobs. Moving in this case from the right to the left, for any form of alternative work, of those with a second job, 57% reported that that was an alternative work in kind of employment engagement versus 29% for in a main job. In terms of app-based work, 18% of those who held it, who had a second job reported that they got their work through an app versus 9% in a main job. And when you combine the two, 61% in either app or alt work who had a second job got the job, um, it, the rates of alternative and app-based work were higher in second jobs, as you can see. Next slide. Contingent work is also more common in second jobs. Um, again, between seven and 12%, depending on how you define it, are contingent. But um, second jobs, the rates are much higher than they are in um, main jobs. Still, and this is really an important concept, the vast majority of non-traditional work is performed as a main job. Even though the rates are higher in second jobs, recall that only about 22% of Californians had two or more jobs. So it stands to reason that the vast majority of non-traditional work is performed as a main job. So we see that for independent contractors of slightly fewer than four million, uh, 5 million who were independent contractors, 3.1 did it in their main job. For any form of alternative employment, five and a half million versus slightly more than two. For app-based employment, 1.6 million versus 700,000 in a second job, and for contingent employment, 1 million versus 400,000 in a second job. In terms of who does this kind of work, women were slightly more likely to have one to alternative employment, um, and you can see that in the second set of bars, but there's no substantial difference by gender in independent contracting, app-based work, or contingent work. There's no consistent pattern across the kinds of employment by race, ethnicity. You can see that the bars that are highest are different depending on the kinds of work. But there are clear patterns by age. Older workers 
like myself and we're likely to be independent contractors or have alternative work. See that in the green bar, that's the older group and it's a pretty step relationship. But younger workers are more likely to have app-based jobs or contingent work. Again, a steep step relationship, although the prevalence is or smaller than independent contracting or any form of alternative work. Independent contracting, alternative employment, app-based work, and contingent employment is much less common with higher levels of education. I want to make something very clear. For all of these forms of employment, there are people with graduate degrees who do the kinds of work, and um, but it's much less common than it is for those with lower levels of education, even though they're pretty, um, these are classic step relationships with education. So there are wealthy contractors with graduate degrees who make a go of it, but their numbers and the proportions are smaller than those with lower levels of education. Those born outside the US are slightly more likely to report alternative work, but there's no difference by nativity in independent contracting, app-based work, or contingent employment. People with disabilities are slightly more likely to have alternative app-based and contingent employment um, than those who are not disabled. And we know from other studies that people with disabilities are often relegated to secondary labor markets, and that seems to apply here as well. So now we turn to some of the economic impacts of the kinds of work that Californians do. And we begin by simply noting that large fractions of working age Californians report low individual earnings, 43% earn less than $40,000 a year. Low household earn earnings, 26%, are in households with lower than $40,000 of income, despite having other household members. And 19% are in households living at or below 125% of the federal poverty limit. We use a higher federal poverty limit because the cost of living in California would render the usual 100% definition meaningless. It's very expensive to live here, as many people on this call know. So when we asked about how adequate their income was by various questions, 18% of working age Californians expect hardships in food, housing, or medical care in the near future. The exact question asks, do you expect to experience this in the next two months? So approximately one in five Californians answered yes. A quarter of working age Californians could not sustain an emergency expense of $400. And nearly a third one third report at least some difficulty living on their household income. 7% of Californians who were employed in the year prior to interview used a food bank and 11 received SNAP benefits, otherwise known as food stamps and that's earlier incarnation. And I didn't include it in the headline but 27% of those whom we interviewed had in the year prior interview um, received some COVID cash from the federal government. Alternative workers and independent contractors are more likely to report low earnings, low household income, and poverty level income than those not in those forms. And you can see that the differences in poverty rate are substantial. It's about 50% greater rate for those in alternative versus not alternative employment. And the same relationships hold for independent contractors, the largest category of alternative employment versus those who aren't. Um, so this should not be surprising, but it is still a stark reminder of their income situation. We move on. App-based and contingent workers are also more likely to report low earnings, low household incomes, and poverty level incomes. 
So when um, some people say that the app-based workers do this for a little extra cash and to keep themselves um, in the things they want, that's maybe true, but um, still a third of those meet our definition of piracy. In terms of contingent works, the relation contingent work, the relationships are very similar. And I should add that the results I'm presenting on um, earnings levels and um, economic effects are controlled for um, other demographic characteristics. So they're not due to the fact that people of different characteristics hold these kinds of jobs. Alternative workers, independent contractors are more likely to expect financial hardship in food, medical care, or housing in the next two months. Um, and um, that's about as stringent a question as one can um, elicit information about. And there's a six percentage point difference for those in any form, alternative work and three percentage points for um, in terms of independent contracting, the largest form. App-based and contingent workers are also more likely to experience financial distress. Alternative and independent contractors are more likely to be SNAP beneficiaries, and the differences are um, about 20 or 30 percent. And um, so these kinds of workers are um, on the public purse to a greater extent. App based contingent workers are also more likely to be TANF and SNAP beneficiaries and to use food banks than um, those who aren't app workers or who aren't contingent workers. Turning to health status, we found no evidence that alternative workers or independent contractors are in poorer health. We use standard federal question, federal survey questions that get at um, overall health status in terms of physical health and mental health. And we could find no evidence that alternative workers or independent contractors are in poorer health. Here, the results are controlling for other demographic characteristics, but the same result um, obtains when you look at that one variable alone. App-based work is not also not strongly associated with poor mental health. However, contingent workers are substantially more likely to report both forms of poor health, poor physical health and poor mental health. Results that, that were um, in this case about 25% greater rates of both. So to summarize some of the results that I've just showed you, if I can move the cursor to the advance the slide. In terms of the yield from the kinds of survey we administered based on the work we had done to develop it, much alternative contingent and app-based employment is hidden if surveys only ask about the main job in the week prior to interview. The yield in the California Working Health Survey increased these forms of employment by between 28 and 56%. The rates of these kinds of employment are much higher in second jobs, but 70% or more of these kinds of work are in main jobs. Who does these kinds of work? Alternative contingent and app-based work is less common for those with higher levels of education. Alternative contingent employment is more common among older workers, while app-based work is less common in this age group. Persons with disabilities have higher rates of these kinds of jobs. Alternative contingent and app-based work is associated with low personal earnings, low household income, household income at or below 125% of the federal poverty level and receipt of, receipt of SNAP benefits. App-based work is also associated with the receipt of SSI 
and TANF benefits and the use of food banks. And also with expecting hardship in food, housing, or medical care in the two months after interview. Alternative employment and being an independent contractor, its largest form, are not associated with any health status measure. App-based work is also not associated with any health status measure, although I note that there's a non-significant trend for app-based work to be associated with each measure, but it didn't reach statistical significance. Contingent employment, on the other hand, is strongly associated with both poor physical health status and poor mental health status. So stay tuned though. Economic outcomes in the California Work and Health Survey are measured in same time frame of employment. So we can really say that the poverty is the result of the kind of employment. But health status, as you know, may unfold over decades. And so the association between work and health may be due to unhealthy workers selecting into certain kinds of jobs or being forced into them due to discrimination or conversely due to the adverse impact of those jobs. Because the health status may unfold over time and it's hard to disentangle cause and effect between work and health, California Work and Health Survey will have a second wave of data collection in 2025 to ensure that the measures of work precede the health changes. Then we'll have greater certainty about that relationship. So in the 20th century, we developed, it's not to say it's an impermeable firewall, but it's a firewall, nevertheless, of protections to workers. And um, our colleague from the California Labor Lab published these data, um, Kristen Cummings and colleague, published these data 15 years ago, um, well after the 20th century ended, I might add. And you can see all of the protections that were developed, Workers' Comp, National Labor Relations Act, State Unemployment Service goes on and on. The last two, of course, were Amer Americans with Disabilities Act and the Family Medical Leave Act. But to conclude, the public pays currently for alternative contingent app-based work through income transfers because we don't have that kind of firewall. And the California Work and Health Survey underestimates the cost to the public of this kind of work because we didn't collect data on the earned income tax credit. That's very hard to get data on. You almost need the tax return to do that and Medicaid due to the um, length of the survey as it is. But the worker also pays now for these kinds of employment through lower earnings and income. And we should say, we also underestimate these effects since earnings are gross amounts. And in the qualitative interviews that we did with say rideshare workers and some delivery people, doesn't take into account the normal expenses with owning a car. And obviously during the time of the survey, the price of gas and many other goods were inflating rapidly. Both the public and the worker pay in the future do the absence of workplace protections built up in the 20th century for traditional jobs and lower rates of pension coverage, which may result in economic and health insecurity going forward. So public policy at the federal and state level levels is either focused or should be on the legal and regulatory approaches to building a 21st century firewall. And I'd like to close with some acknowledgements. The investigative team thanks the 4,000 plus Californians who gave us up to 45 minutes of their time for these detailed interviews. To key informants, cognitive interview respondents and pilot study participants beyond those 4,000. For questionnaire development and survey design, I thank Mark, um, Paul Blanc, Mark e. Camillo. Carissa Harris, Kristen Hartnett, Ken Jacobs, and Patty Katz. For data collection, 
I thank Jason Kearns and his crack team at Davis Research. This was a very difficult survey to implement. And the fact that we have such a high participation rate and over 4,000 respondents, Jason, we're indebted to you and your team. For post-collection statistical issues, we thank Jing Cheng and Mark DiCamillo, and also the California Health Interviews faculty and staff from UCLA who helped us devise techniques for waiting. And with that, I will stop sharing. I will say um, before I turn it over to Laura for the questions and answers that um, on our website, you can get much more information about the California Work in Health Survey, and you can actually request the data um, through the website as well. And with that, I turn it over to Laura for the question and answers, and I thank you for your attention. Well, thanks, Ed. Great presentation. And I hope I can see all the claps going up. Um, there's over 100 people have been on the call on the webinar all, all this time. Um, so gratifying to see that people were finding it interesting. Um, and I am looking at some questions that are coming in right now. I encourage you, we have time for, for questions. So go ahead and put them in the Q&A box. Um, I had an interesting question come in related to Proposition 22 that was passed in, in 2020. How do we think the how do you think the um, this might have influenced the responses, particularly around app-based work? So that's a really good question. And um, we do um, did collect information that will allow us to estimate the degree of misclassification. We're turning to those data in earnest. In fact, Laura is going to lead our effort in that direction. Um, we think that there are a significant number of workers who are misclassified um, by the, um, and more because of Prop 22, which undid a lot of the reforms of AB5. Um, and we'll be able to put numbers on that going forward. Um, I wish that we had had the time between first getting the data available to make some of those estimates. We've just looked at some of the top line questions about misclassification. And um, I will say this, it's highly unlikely that the impact of these forms of employment on economic and health measures would likely change. It, amounts to noise in the definition of who's classified in these characteristics. And we still found quite profound effects. That's, um, so this, that's another part of stay tuned because we will be getting to that set of analyses um, more emphatically in the months to come. Thanks. And um, do, are you aware of any similar studies in the US? Well, I do know that the BLS is currently in the field with a work in health, uh, their contingent worker supplement. And I believe that they are asking about second jobs. I am not aware. I do not think that they are at extending the time frame from a week to 30 days. Um, but I, um, I'm not 100% certain of that answer. And of course, not to put in a plug here for the Work and Health Survey, but the BLS does not ask questions on the health side to any right. extent. Yeah, you've just pointed out one of the conundrums in most countries in the world. For instance, I've done some work with Canadian data. They have one statistical agency that handles all aspects of human and um, activity. We have two majors, the Census Bureau, which collects information on employment for the Bureau of Labor Statistics. In their surveys, there are very few health questions. And the National Center for Health Statistics, which collects information on people's health and has very few employment. So our goal was to meld those two so we can really have a fuller picture of the relationship between work and health. 
All right, uh, a couple more questions. I think we're good on time. Um, what are the characteristics of those who refuse to participate and how might they have that have influenced your conclusions? I wish that we could bring in our analyst on this project because she just ran that information and uh, I'm not sure I can put my hands on it in the time that it would take, but my general impression was, I'm sorry, Ed, I'm answering the question. I knew this was gonna happen. I'm glad you are. <laughs> anyway, I, my general impression was that we, we have very limited information about people who essentially started the questionnaire and then dropped out. Um, before completing it. Most people, we don't have any information on because it's just their the phone number that was dialed. Um, but for those people who did at least start and, and then drop off, I think there were more of the people who dropped off were employed. And I think they were probably a little bit um, younger, but in general, there weren't a lot of characteristics of what we had um, to, to compare to. Um, so I do. Do you have anything else to add to that? Well, it's you know a classic problem in epidemiology is how do you analyze? You know, you can't ask people who didn't show up what they're about. We the only question that was in the screener that's a demographic item was the age question because we needed that to to see whether or not individuals were in our age range. And, but it's a very broad age range that encompasses something like 80% of Californians. So it's not very um, helpful in that regard. I will say this, that even before waiting, um, we had done, we, but especially after waiting, we replicate the estimates of characteristics of the California population in terms of demographics very well. We have um, a very high proportion of Hispanics and Asians, um, very similar to those who are to the federal um, CPS estimates of those characteristics. So in that sense, we think we're very representative. Great. I'm going to rattle through a few more questions here. And some of them are very factual and I'll just answer since I am a co-investigator. And some of them, and the, the ones that are harder, I'll give to you, Ed. Um, <laughs> so did we, did we capture documentation on citizen status along with nativity? We did not ask citizen status. It's a kind of a, a, um, a sensitive subject. And people, this was a you know, a survey where we were collecting people's names uh, for follow-up. So we did not ask that information. Um, data, is the data publicly available? Yes, and I believe that Michelle will be posting in the chat. Um, we, we are open to considering uh, proposals for, for if you are interested in, in doing a, an analysis on, on your own. And that link for that is right there. Um, uh, the survey was conducted in Spanish and English. That's another question that came along. Um, and here is another question. Sorry. Yeah, here we go. Um, is it demonstrated that relatively unprotected workers experience high incident rates, higher incident incidents of acute on-the-job injuries? Um, have we, we will have the data to address that. Um, I, I initially did some quick runs, and they do have they have higher rates of reported on the job injuries in the year prior to interview. Um, I there's kind of a complex set of questions that address that, and we haven't delved into it as much as we can. But the in terms of um, slower acting etiologies. So for instance, um, many ergonomic problems um, take a while to unfold. And that's why you do a longitudinal survey. So you can look at the incidents over time, having their baseline employment information as a predictor for the changes that occur in their health going forward. Great. I think that we have 
answered all the questions that have come in. You are welcome to field some more. Um, I think that, Ed, do you want to talk more about where we're going next with this? Since we have we have a few more minutes yet. Yeah. Um, one thing that we hope to do, because I think the data, even the, these first cuts that I've shown today, speak to the issue of um, the impacts on the economic well-being of California's workers. Um, and we hope to take these results and through the California Labor Labs Policy um, Forum, work with legislators and um, advocates to um, try and create the evidence base for a firewall um, or the beginnings of a firewall. Now, the state legislature through AB5, which was partially undone by Prop 22, are certainly aware of these issues. And we have had um, discussions with several members of the legislature about our results. But, um, you know, we're hoping that this can provide the evidence base. And we also hope to go to Washington because I think, although I think some of these um, characteristics of work may be more um, prevalent in California, they're on their way. And um, so um, it doesn't help uh, somebody who lives just the side of Nevada border if Nevada doesn't also deal with these problems. And after all, Nevada and Arizona and Oregon are tied to California. Many of the warehouse jobs that um, for the large app-based retailers are in Nevada and they serve as the California labor market. Many of the tech firms have outsourced a lot of office jobs to Arizona and Southern Oregon, as well as Nevada. So um, we're doing a study in California, but California is, well, the cliche is that it's fifth or sixth largest economy in the world, and it's embedded in relationships with other states as well as other foreign countries. So we know that there's a limit to addressing um, the policy needs of workers in these fields um, and for increased protections on a local or state-based level, but it's a start. And we certainly commend the California legislature for being ahead of most other states and thinking about these problems. Great, thank you. Um, I think that there's one more question in the chat, uh, sorry, in the Q&A about um, response rates. Oh, questionnaire response rates at different by different age group, education level, ethnicity, and gender. Yeah, that's what we were saying in the or earlier. Sorry if it wasn't clear. The only thing we have for people who did not respond, did not fully respond, uh, is based on age and gender, were the two things we collected in the screener. Um, we also included that first question about employment status, and when we looked at that, we can we can make some uh, 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 we can make some conclusions about about the response rates based on that. But we don't really have any information about the rest of the questions for people who didn't answer. Uh, so, well, so. what we do know is once somebody committed to the survey, there's very little missing data among the 4,014 people. Mm -hmm. So um, even though we demanded a lot of them, for those who did it in the, in the um, who did it by survey interviewer, they spent an average of over 40 minutes on the phone with our service workers. And um, yeah. so we're very appreciative of their commitment and, um, to the thoroughness of the survey interviewers because there's very little missing data. And in fact, if I can just jump in, most of the people who started the, the, the survey completed it 
And for people who had two jobs, would they ask that they 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 were on the phone for an hour? It was long, long surveys. Um, I think that we're at time. Yeah, I, I hope know, that we can. Questions? Since I was busy talking away, I didn't see all the chat comments. I hope we can preserve. They are, they are preserved. Yes. Great. So. Um, and we have some. I just want to read one. Thank you very much for the presentation. Greeting from Costa Rica. We are struggling oh. to apply the third Central America. Sorry, I'm reading on my other screen. Central America Employment, Working, and Health Conditions Survey. The second one was in 2018. That'd be interesting to look at. Indeed. I hope that um, you'll get in touch with us if you're still on the call. Um, right. And before I go, I want to thank, uh, I, I said it twice in acknowledgments, but it bears a third one. Um, Jason, you and your staff did such an amazing job of data collection, and I value your input into the design of it and the implementation. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Absolutely. Michelle, do you close us out? Hello, no, but that's, uh, thank you all so much for being here and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye everyone.